to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Welcome to Urho the Way, an online outreach ministry to disseminate the love of triune God through the witness and life of the Surya Orthodox Church. My name is Father Ranjan Matthew. We are so excited to introduce to you this evening Dr. Gianni Nicole Malone St. Laurent. Dr. St. Laurent is a scholar of Syriac Studies and Associate Professor of Market University, Wisconsin. She specialized in hagiography and sacred narrative. Dr. St. Laurent is the author and co-author of many books like the Missionary Stories and the Formation of Syriac Churches, The History of Mor Behenan and Sarah, The Gateway of the Syriac Saints and so on. This conversation highlights the missionary stories and the formation of the Syriac churches, the mission of St. Thomas to India, the role of hagiography in the Syriac tradition, and we'll, like, we'll talk about the online database projects like Gateway to the Syriac Saints and so on. Let us welcome Dr. Gianni Nicole Malone, St. Laurent. Thank you. Delighted to be here with you this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren, for being with us and welcome again to Urho the Way Conversation on Syriac Christianity. We are so excited that you are here. So tell us about your academic journey. What made you drew into the Syriac studies and early Christianity? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I studied classics and theology as an undergraduate um, at Gonzaga University many years ago. And then when I started my master's uh, program in early Christian studies at the University of Notre Dame, I had the opportunity um, to expand my language training from beyond Latin and Greek to Syriac. Um, and before that, I didn't know anything about that. Um, and, uh, and I had a wonderful teacher, uh, Professor Joseph Amar, um, who was a Maronite priest from the Maronite tradition. And he taught me and I was absolutely captivated by the beauty of the language. Um, and for me, it was a whole new insight, a whole new way of understanding the Christian tradition to look at the Semitic uh, roots, um, Syriac, as a dialect of Aramaic, um, very close, of course, to the language that Jesus spoke. And so for me, uh, as, a young, as a young graduate student, I realized that this was the tradition that I wanted to make for the focus of my own studies. Um, and I realized also that there was so much work to do. And I, and I was fascinated in particular with the lives of the saints. I had always been interested in the stories of the saints um, I myself am from the Catholic tradition, but I realized there was a whole other world, uh, a whole other um, catalog, hierarchy of holy men and women that I never heard of coming from the Syriac church. And so I really was um, interested in focusing on that and studying that. And so then I, I started working with Dr. Susan Ashbrook Harvey, who was my doctoral advisor at Brown. I went on to study with her. And then I finished up there and wrote a dissertation on, on head geography in the Syriac tradition. That's really interesting. You know, you ended up with Dr. Susan Ashbrook Harvey. You did your PhD uh, with her. So mm -hmm. tell us about your unique interest in hagiography and sacred narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I... I always been um, intrigued by the unique genre of hagiography because on the one hand um, there's stories and so um, they're sort of they, they tell the stories of, of the holy men and women um, but they don't just tell us about the people themselves that is to say they don't just tell us about the saints themselves they also tell us about the communities who venerated the saints and so I was really interested to ask the question, how can we study the lives of the saints, not just for insights into um, the people who are commemorated in these stories, but also the communities that commemorated to them. And so for me, it was always those two wings together that I had an idea that maybe 
it would be an interesting way to look at the history of Christianity, not just through the lens of doctrinal treatises or controversies um, and theological disputes, but what about the stories of the holy people? And um, in fact, by studying them comparatively, I was hoping that you could I could gain some more understanding <clears throat> about these communities and the symbols that are shown in the lives of these holy people, what those symbols also teach us um, about the communities themselves. So that was that was my um, that was my angle, my interest. And of course, I was especially interested in the lives of holy women, um, too, which had been um, neglected. Uh, and I thought that could be a, a more another interesting angle. So I had a, a variety a variety of interests. <laughs> That's interesting. After, um, uh, Susan Harvey, she also had some special interest in um, the unknown women, the holy women of the church, especially in the Syriac tradition. So you mm -hmm. hear that, you know, many people are coming up with, uh, um, you know, studying um, the women uh, from their perspective. And I believe we, we can discuss more about that. We can discuss about, you know, hagiography, reading hagiography in a more inclusive language later at this conversation. So tell mm -hmm. us about your PhD dissertation on apostolic memories, mm -hmm. related differentiation and the construct of orthodoxy in Syria. <laughs> missionary literature that was the long title yeah that is exactly a very long title way too long um i i published it um later on as a book as you know which you mentioned later um, and i tried to clean it up a, a much more in the book version but uh one thing that i noticed um in my studies of the syriac hagiography was um they had a particular interest um of, of promoting missionary saints. And of course, this isn't particular to Syriac Christianity. The Christian church itself was a missionary church all the way back to the beginnings with the apostles, um, Paul and all the apostles. And the idea that every apostle um, was commissioned by Jesus to go to a different region and to bring the Christian message, the Christian religion. That's a, that's a tradition that all of the churches and early Christian Christianity share. But in the Syriac church, what was interesting to me was that the missionary saint itself had a particular, um, had a particular um, exaggerated, embellished form and commemoration, not just in the early stories of the Syriac church, but even in the later churches in the later um, the later periods. So I wanted to look at how the earliest um, figure of the missionary saint, which was the most important was St. Thomas, the apostle to India, uh, and how he became the prototype, as it were, for all subsequent missionary stories, um, like the story of the teaching of the apostle Adzai, uh, the story of Marmari, um, which are more, uh, so is St. Thomas and Mar Adai and Marmari, those stories were more um, elaborated um, narratives. But you see it also in later hagiography hey from the 6th and 7th centuries with the shorter um, episodic stories that, you, that I found in St. John of Ephesus' Lives of the Eastern Saints. So what I wanted to do was to see how... Um, the, the initial literary themes, theological themes that were present already in the stories of St. Thomas, how those reappear and get reused by the communities in different ways to present an argument of their orthodoxy. So what I tried to show was that the missionary state is vital for every church, for every community, for every monastery to show a connection back to Jesus. And so communities, when when they were trying to show their orthodoxy, present a history of their past, the missionary state was a vital link in that process. And, um, and that's what I tried to show. And it was, really, it was really interesting to see how the symbol, in one sense, did remain the same, but it, it, it got reworked and um, reconfigured and modified for different um, purposes in the, later, in the later churches as well. But the memory of the missionary saint was always very strong the Syriac church 
And of course, the Syriac church grew through the, 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 um, the trade routes all the way to India. So not just the missionary saint, but the merchant saint, like St. Thomas was along. Um, it's, it's believed that Christianity did reach India and the East by way of the trade routes. And so it makes absolutely beautiful sense that they would dress their St. Thomas, that they would um, garb him in the cloaks of, of a merchant. It makes sense because that's what they were too. So you start to see the link between the apostle themselves, the saints themselves, but also the values of the people who were promoting these saints. We are specifically, um, uh, thank you for that elaborate, uh, I mean, you know, summarizing your, your work and, you know, that led to the book itself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, so we are interested more in the mission of St. Thomas, um, um, Afghan, China, Northern India. So tell us more about that, like, you know. The yeah. So um, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a wonderful, um, rich tradition, um, both uh, that has both literary artifacts as well as cultural um, artifacts, um, objects and churches, that is to say. So there's all kinds of um, different lenses through which we can understand this um, and uh, commemorating or culminating um, in the tradition of Thomas being buried in India at the site of his martyrdom. As a matter of fact, my, my late father um, had gone to India at one point and when was met by the Christians there who showed him the tomb of St. Thomas. And so, you know, the, the very, the living tradition um, that's, so, that's so precious to the St. Thomas Christians, all the way back to the more ancient tradition, um, and it's interesting too, from a from a sort of more academic point of view, to see that Saint Thomas was, and the stories of Saint Thomas. So you have the Acts of Thomas, that's the longest um, text that describes Thomas uh, journeying to India, and all along the way, what he's doing is he's converting kings, princes. So the king. So the story um, uh, talks about Thomas being commemorated by Jesus. He's, he's, um, he's, he's commissioned rather, he's commissioned by Jesus to go to India and he doesn't want to go, which is an interesting theme. In the beginning of the story talks about him being an unwilling apostle. Um, he doesn't want to go to India, but he must because that's his vocation. That's what Christ has picked for him. Um, and so the story goes, he's actually sold into slavery According to the Acts of Thomas, he's sold into slavery um, and joins up um, with a with a carpenter, with a tradesman, um, and and he's sort of undercover as the missionary saint. And so he comes to the first um, kingdom, which, according, it's it's not exactly clear in the story where exactly these locations are. That that, that it's it's disputed. Um, some people think what was meant by India in this text was probably what would be considered Northern India today. It's a little bit hard to know, um, mostly because the Acts of Thomas itself was a composite text. So there was earlier portions and then got added to and elaborated upon. But the main theme was that he was converting kingdoms um, and he would come with the message of Christianity that would overturn societies. And so the themes was that he would come and uh, the conversion, the message of Christianity was disruptive to the, uh, to the local kingdom um, and people resisted, but um, he converts their hearts. And so in one instance, the first act, he converts a princess and a prince of the kingdom uh, to Christianity and along with them comes others then. And so one after another, kingdoms convert. And so the idea that the missionary apostle like St. Thomas started coming into a community and then converts the king and then it sort of converts the whole society along with it, that's the theme. And what's prioritized too are care of the poor. So throughout the story, Thomas is, for instance, there's a, there's a story where he's um, given money from the king to build a palace 
And instead of building the palace, he's giving it away to the poor. And he says, well, I'm building a palace in the kingdom of heaven. So the idea that the stress on care of the poor and also on healing um, all along the way, just as Jesus says in the Gospels, St. Thomas, um, his twin, uh, he's, um, he's, he's, he's healing body and soul. And so the conversion of the heart is, is always with the body too. Everything goes along. And so it's a very beautiful text. And, um, but the, 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 the hard part is that it's not always exactly clear historically where he was going. And so scholars have tried to recreate that. Um, certainly though, it's it attests in my mind, um, it's an attestation that Christianity did come to India um, through these trade routes. And there certainly was some connection to St. Thomas, even if we can't get an exact pinpoint. Um, and because it's such an ancient tradition going all the way back to the yeah, early church. Yeah. And many of the things are kind of controversial as well, right? Yeah. Um, the the Th St. Thomas was also, the, the Acts of Thomas was also a text that was popular in um, what the later church would call heretical groups, like the Manichaeans and other groups. Um, so that was an interesting piece, too. It, he was apostle that everybody wanted to connect to. Um, and that's where the that's where the argument about orthodoxy comes into play, because, um, of course, uh, uh, the Orthodox Church will um, show that their that their story is is the most in line with the tradition. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that mm -hmm. uh, uh, great elaborative uh, reflection. Yeah, here at Urho the way we have. Um, weekly series of volunteer presented research called walking the way with the saints and you mm, have wonderful work on the method of analysis in hagiography and how to approach hagiography maybe for the lay faithful while studying hagiography, mm -hmm. and how should hagiography be used to help in disseminating the good news of our lord jesus Christ? Yeah, oh, it's a wonderful question. You oh. go about, you know, uh, working mm -hmm. on these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, the interest, the wonderful thing is that each saint is is unique. So hagiography, I like to think if this is helpful as an analogy, I like to think of hagiography. The lives of the saints are a literary counterpart to an icon. So in the same way in the church, as we have, uh, we have icons, we have, we have pictures of the saints. And when you look at a picture of a saint, the picture teaches you something about that man or woman, whether it be through the symbols that he or she is holding, what they are dressed in. Um, it's meant to um, pull you out of this world for a little bit and think about the next world. And so it's always important to remember that hagiography is not like a straightforward history. It's a sacred text. It's meant to bring the reader um, into the life of God through showing what it means to be a man or a woman of God. And so I think theologically, um, it's, it's very powerful because it, it, the, the lives of the saints teach us what's capable, what we're capable of. It's this sense that no matter, no matter what you do or matter what you've done um, with, with, with the love of God and with, 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 with fidelity and faithfulness in God, anything is possible. Um, and what's so wonderful about the saints too. So, so you have to see it um, in that, in that light, I would say. So there what the hagiographer is going to do is not tell us everything about the person's life. It's not a biography. It's an episodic, just a moment in the important parts. And then they will expand upon those important parts, embellish a little bit, but always with the view of showing um, how that person modeled God. Because in the back of the text is always the life of Jesus and the apostles. Um, and so, um, and there's all different types of saints. And so when I teach this to my students, it's really wonderful for, for them to see 
um, you know, if you were a doctor, there were doctor saints, there were healing saints. If you were a soldier, there were soldier saints. If you were, um, if you were a sinful woman, there, 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 sinful women became great saints in the eyes of the church, monks and so on. So there's all these different types and they teach us and they challenge us even more so today because the powerful thing too I've, I've noticed in is that the lives of the saints we read them but they are reading us too they're they by, by reading the lives of the saints it it causes us to reflect upon our own lives as christians and think about how where where are the areas where god is calling us into holiness as a lay person or or whatever that um the you know, like in in the ancient world, they talked about um, distractions for the monks, that the different the different struggles that the, the monk would have in the ascetic life. Well, we have distractions too. I mean, in today's time, there's all kinds of distractions, and so there's there's a lot of analogies that can be drawn. So they're meant to inspire, and then and and they. And they're meant to be imitated too. It's not just meant, uh, they're not just meant to be read, but they're meant, it's, it's a call to imitation. Thank you. And that helped, that helped like Christ to the uh, sacred narrative of saints. Uh, so that really helps. I mean, so um, I was reading one of your paper, a paper on Syriac hagiography literature. And these are your concluding remarks. Let me read that for our viewers. <laughs> Christians identified, I mean, Syrian Christians identified the saints as their models of holiness. And they claimed them for the tradition through the composition of the geographic literature. The saints are a vital component of Syriac Christian theology. Hagiographic literature expresses this theology in vivid color with narrative and poetic text that engage the imagination and memory. Is there something in Syriac hagiographical text that you would you find unique from other kingdom? Is there a thing you have come across in the Syriac Orthodox world that you find interesting and wish? that you know, he or she would have been better known to the public and to the Soviet Orthodox mm, That's a wonderful question. Uh, yes, I would say there's, um, are, are you asking about a particular saint or is sort of in a general sense, what makes Syriac hagiography unique? A particular saint, I mean, and we always talk about Saint Ephraim, I mean, you know, but you know, yeah. you are a person who, mm -hmm. you, um, who has in-depth knowledge on hagiography and sacred narratives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, one of the my favorite, um, well, there's a couple. Uh, St. Simeon the Stylite, he's one of the most important tradition uh, saints of the Syriac Church. And he is in his own category. To think, um, so for viewers who aren't familiar with his story, um, he was a monk um, who in an effort to devote himself fuller, uh, more fully to God, stood on top of a pillar for most of his life, um, subduing his body and raising his soul to God. And the idea that a man would step, would stand on a pillar as that, as this, as this sign, literally staggered between heaven and earth, um, was is it, it, is quite unique. I mean, this is this is this doesn't exist in other. Traditions. I mean, this this was he was outside of um, uh, what is outside of the city of Aleppo, what is now Aleppo today, um, and so that image of the stylite saint is certainly one of my favorites from Syriac Christianity. But to counter uh, Saint Simeon, who in, in many ways is a very theatrical image, I mean, it, I mean, who wouldn't be you know find that a compelling image? There was also um, an emphasis on Syriac hagiography on anonymous, uh, you know, anonymous holiness. So one of the most beautiful traditions in the Syriac church is the story of the Syrian man of God. He lived in Edessa, this man of God. 
and um, it's a Syriac hagiography, which will which goes off in in different forms to the Latin and Greek world, but its origins Syriac. And the story was that this was a prince from Rome who left Rome the night of his wedding um, because he wanted to live a life of poverty. Um, he wanted to live a life of simplicity. So he journeys to Edessa, to Or Orhoi, <laughs> and he lives um, as a beggar. Uh, and nobody knows who he is except the porter of the church. At night, the porter of the church sees the man of God praying um, and is moved by that. And it's only after his death that people realize who he was. And here he was, a prince and in beggar's clothes all, all along. And so I think that's a beautiful, um, beautiful, powerful image that holiness can be hidden. In fact, hold, that maybe that's, that it's, it can be all around us. So the story of, 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 of an, in a city, you can find these things, that there's, there could be a saint all around you if you know how to look for it. Um, so that's certainly also one of my most uh, favorite scenes. And then one final, if I may, it would be a story of a mother and a daughter, Mary and Euphemia. And this is from the later tradition, the sixth century tradition, John of Ephesus, Mary and Euphemia, two, a mother and a daughter uh, who together um, care for the poor out of their own, um, the work of their hands together. They have all of these ministries going on outside of their house with tremendous energy. And so it's wonderful that they, that there exists also an image of, of a married woman and her daughter, um, participating in that. So one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those, those are in really interesting. Um, now, we have a term, Jacobite. Uh, for the Syriac Orthodox faithful in India, the term Jacobite, it's controversial elsewhere and is an essential mm -hmm. part of our identity as Christians in Malankara. It is a term wholly accepted in a positive light and connecting our ancient community of Indian Christians is evangelized by St. Thomas to the Church of St. Jacob Bordius and St. Severius, ultimately the St. Peter's Holy See of Antioch. Would you say that the controversial usage of the, of the term Jacobite by the adversaries of the Syriac Orthodox um, in the history to portray her as a new church rather than a rightful continuity is similar to other such historical examples political frame to marginalize. Yeah, well, I am quite, um, I'm a big, let's, let's just say I, I, um, I'm a big fan, for lack of a better word. I'm very enthusiastic about the stories of Jacob Barides. He's one of my favorite saints. And as you would know, I have a chapter on him in my book. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I think it's interesting um, to, to consider him the man, to think of who Jacob Barides was. Um, before, it, it is certainly um, lamentable that the term Jacobite came to have this sort of negative um, idea, sort of saying that the followers of, of the Jacobite church versus the followers of the Byzantine, you know, the, the, the church of the king or what have you. But the positive thing is that he's a wonderful man and an incredible person. So the stories of Jacob Baradeus tell us about this, um, this monk who was um, so committed to the Church of Severus of Antioch, to the uh, Miophysite Christological positions and all the bishops, and um, that he was indefatigable. He was traveling from village to village, monk, monastery to monastery, ordaining priests, trying to keep these communities alive. And so, um, and so again, um, I, if, you, if you think of him as a hero of your church, then it's a wonderful thing to be called a Jacobite, actually, and it's true in the in retrospect that the, the term did get had this negative um, uh, connotation because um, there was some uh, disputes happening between some of the leaders in the in the Syrian Orthodox Church, 
Um, but in, in its origin, though, it's interesting, though, because later uh, you'll see that it's not considered a put down anymore. That is to say, the church itself will reclaim Jacobite as a positive thing as the memory of Jacob Barhadeus is elevated. So in my book, I took, I look, I, I analyzed two different stories of his life. And what was so interesting was to see that the later version from the eighth century greatly expanded upon the first version. And you could see that um, the elaborations in the stories of Jacob Barhadeus showed how much respect and pride the church had that, that at that point then they were quite proud to be called Jacobites. They took what was originally a sort of put down, reclaimed it for themselves, and then self-identified that way with great pride, as I understood it. Now, um, as for its propriety in the modern sort of um, ecclesiastical organization, that's perhaps a different question. But um, but I think when you just focus on the figure of Jacob Baradeus, um, he's very inspiring uh, saint and a very inspiring uh, missionary saint. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, in the modern sense, like you know, we still use with um, you know a, you know a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of you know with that heritage, like you know, despite uh, being a persecuted community, though people made fun of that term, you know that is still part of the identity and, uh, you know we hold that um to you know very much to to you know to our hearts and bottom of our hearts so could you speak about the ground level presence of miaphysite faithful during the years of saint Severius patriarchal tenor you mentioned that though the bishops were replaced many of the faithful remained loyal to the non chalcedon movement and though they experienced mm -hmm. the most violent in the oriental provinces they found a heaven in numerous monasteries and their partisans and what was the real presence of Miaphysite faithful during the time of St. Severius? Mm. As far as actual numbers, um, I'm not, I, 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 I hesitate to, to give an exact number, but it was certainly a, a, a large number. That's, that's for certain. Um, and what, what we probably imagine is that um, it, it's, the bishops understood and the, the lead, and the and the abbots of the monasteries, they and those who were theologically trained, they understood the doctrinal controversies that were happening. But it's probably unrealistic to think that all the laity did. In the same way that even today, you're not going to get every person who's a faithful person coming coming to church doesn't necessarily have all the theology at his or her fingertips to rattle off. So that's why the fidelity to the bishop was so important. Um, and you you followed you followed your bishop, um, even if it came at a cost. But the bishops themselves had to be extremely um, uh, like if you take a person like Jacob of uh, Sarug, for instance, who was also of this same time, powerful uh, homilist who would preach the Christology, for instance, very 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 effectively. Um, to to the faithful. So it had to come through the pulpit in that way too, so that they could understand. Um, but it wasn't easy. And, and you can imagine that there was a lot of confusion too going on when um, you didn't really, perhaps not everybody understood what all of the um, fine points of theological, um, Christological articulations, um, but they could see um, that it was important to their leaders. And so they had to try to remain faithful to that. And there was a fear, as you see in the hagiography, there was a, a grave fear of being wrong. I mean, you can't understate that either. I mean, the, the faithful wanted to be on the side of orthodoxy. Um, and so they were often willing to pay a, a price for that if necessary. It's a terrible, it's a sad, it's a sad moment, um, if I may say so, in the history of the church, you know, this moment where Christians were persecuting Christians in this way. Um, and I, I don't know, honestly, if 
any of this would matter anymore, um, you know, to Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians. Would these still be issues today? Probably not, um, in my opinion. So maybe someday we'll get we'll get these things resolved. We can hope for that. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, there are still yeah, issues. I mean, uh, we'll look forward. Yeah, we yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, we talked about this, like you have a special interest in uh, women in Syriac Orient and you know holy women of the church. And um, in your in the in the introduction of your dissertation, you pointed out that these texts were written by a group of group of males, elite males. So we are in the twenty first century. Do you think a different lens is required when reading? these hagiographies without rewriting the existing literary corpus, how may the instructors in the church, the priests, mm -hmm. Sunday school teachers, uh, so or those who are, you know, instructing or those who are preaching, how can they interpret such texts to be more inclusive for all? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Um, I think the most important thing, I mean, luckily you have the greatest saint in the church is is Mary, you know, is the mother of God. And so you can begin with her um, if you want to think of inclusivity. And the traditions of, of Mary, of the Virgin Mary in the Syrian Orthodox Church, um, in the Syriac Church, are um, so incredible and so rich. If you study the presentation, for instance, of Mary in the hymns of Ephraim, uh, Nobody else in Ephraim's time in the fourth century has anything that compares to his portrait of Mary. Um, so you can just begin with that and have an amazing, um, an amazing witness that she is uh, the most important person who has ever lived because it's through Mary that Jesus gets um, his humanity. And in the hymns of Ephraim, so beautifully what you, what you can encounter is a, is a person, yes, she's the mother of God, but she's also um, a model of devotion. So Mary teaches us how to approach her son. She teaches us the wonder with which we must approach um, the incarnation that she, that she experienced in such a unique way because it happened within her own womb. So, I mean, that would be, a, a, that's the most important, I think, place to begin. But um, but there's many, uh, just, just because the lives of the saints were written by men doesn't mean that they still can tell us a lot about, about women. Um, and it's, it's actually quite remarkable. If you take a look um, at, our, our, the project that I worked on with my colleague, Syriaca.org, there's so many women saints in that catalog, martyrs. There were martyr saints. So one of the most popular types of female saints was um, the virgin martyr, the daughters of the covenant, these women who took vows of, of celibacy, um, vows, of, um, vows of pledging their single-hearted devotion to God. Um, they called themselves like, to, they were like a, the bride of Christ. Christ became the one to whom they, they were totally committed. And then they would have to pay a price sometimes in martyrdom. So there's a, there's a very um, powerful tradition of the, of the virgin martyrs, for instance. Um, but then also, as I said, um, <clears throat> there, there's also ordinary people, families, and young people too. There's uh, the, so the the, the the text that that I translated um, with my colleague Kyle Smith, Bethnam and Sarah. That's the story of a, a brother and a sister saint um, that comes, um, which is a fascinating. Um, it's a fascinating story because it shows how even sometimes in families, um, in that the, the tradition is that their own father them to death because they were Christians. And so it's a painful theme to think that Christ, that, that, that this could, that could cause this sort of familial division. But on the other hand, if you think about it, it shows that 
Um, we have this tradition that even a child, even a young person who's devoted to Christ can be a witness, can be a sign of, of holiness and then become a powerful figure. So Bethnam and Sarah become very important um, saints, especially in the Syrian Orthodox Church of Northern Iraq, where there's the monastery there to them. Um, so there's just a wide, uh, a wide array of, of, of types um, and, uh, and, and I think one of my, I just finished translating the story of St. Mary of Egypt, which is it, her, her tradition exists um, in the Greek and Latin tradition as well. But now it was also very popular in the Syriac uh, church. So her life was translated from Greek into, oh yeah, there's our <laughs> project, from Greek into Syriac. And that was a story of a woman who was actually a prostitute for the first 28 years of her life in Alexandria. And um, she has an amazing conversion experience when she goes to Jerusalem and, and, and sees an icon of the mother of God. She sees an icon of the mother of God. And at that moment, she commits herself um, to a life of penance. And she flees into the desert to live out the rest of her life, basically as a monk. And she's, um, nobody knows she's there until a monk called by the name of Zazimus finds her when she's a very old woman. And she tells him her story. And what you see is that, um, the, the, the story of, of the repentant, um, the, the repentant woman who becomes this great lover of Christ, very, very powerful, very, very beautiful. And the friendship that exists between um, between Zazimus and, and St. Mary, too, because I think that's also another really important thing that's worth noting about hagiography um, is that it gives us also not just a vision of single individuals, but also new types of friendships, new types of fam, new types of friendships, new types of bonds between people who both share this devotion um, to Christ as well. So it's uh, it's a whole it, it, um, it's a presentation which considers the whole community to to be transformed, not just not just about one person. Thank you. So, um, so we just mentioned, like, and I tried to share the screen. Would you um, talk, speak a little bit about your work with the gateway to the Syriac mm -hmm. states and the Kadisha projects? So I'm just going to share the screen so that the viewers mm -hmm. can see what all are available. Like, you know, many times the resources, um, the materials are not available, especially for Sunday school students. And like, you know, we can see mm -hmm. that Many people are experimenting a lot of things in a very way, like, you know, we can see Jobin is saying that, like, you know, the, what mm -hmm. their youth group is doing this afternoon. I mean, these are all awesome things. Um, mm -hmm. So would you mind talking about, you know, these projects? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm happy to. Well, uh, the digital humanities is a, a wonderful new field that's been growing in the past 15 years. Um, digital humanities takes the technology of computing um, and what's called linked open data, the way that data can connect so that databases can be joined together so that information can be shared, takes that technology and joins it with the rigor of traditional academic scholarship to create new portals for research. And so um, my colleagues and, and I, and this project was headed up originally by Dr. Dave, David Michelson, who's at Vanderbilt, um, had a vision of creating a portal for Syriac studies. And this is an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing project. Um, but I worked on the Saints uh, module, as it's called, Kadiche, as well as the Bibliotheca Hagiographa Syriaca Electronica, which is a catalog of the saints' lives. So the Kadiche is the people themselves with short descriptions and um, of, of many different saints. I used, when I put that together, um, my base was, I, I used the book um, Saint Syriac by Jean-Marie Fier um, to have short entries on, on all the book, all the saints that he discusses in that book together with some further bibliography. And then um, and then the other database is the, the text themselves. So if you want to 
um, see the, on the hagiography uh, panel. So you have the saints and then the hagiography on the far right there. Um, that And there's um, many, many, many different um, uh, texts, some of which haven't even been edited yet. So the idea was to put um, was to put this project available for free um, so that people would know, have a starting point for further research. And um, so you can see all these different things. So these are, so you can see just how many different, um, each entry there, if you've got Abraham Kudanoya there, represents a different text about that saint. And so you can even see how one saint can have many, many stories or homilies that were written about him or her. So if you're interested, even just on the devotion to different um, different people in the Syriac tradition, it's a wonderful place to start. The person, the saint with the most entries is Mary. So there were more things written about the Virgin the Mary, the mother of God, understandably she's got the most but um and it and when you study the different types of saints you'll start to see some interesting patterns like when i when since we've been talking about women there's a lot of sisters there's a lot of sisters in the in the catalog sisters of famous monks sisters um so you can see again this the the role of like well sarah for instance and bethnam and sarah um, brothers and sisters are, it's like a powerful theme in a lot of the stories of the saints too. But so I encourage you, it's not, it's not um, perfect. There are glitches, but we decided it was more important to get the thing up there. And then people can send us feedback. It's community built. So if ever um, people wanted to add new entries, um, we'd be happy to to add that, that's the wonderful thing about digital humanities is you can continue to update and revise and it's free for everyone to use. Thank you. So uh, this mm -hmm. is exciting. Like, you know, how can, I mean, you know, there may be a few, um, I mean, you know, volunteers who will be interested in participating in these kinds of projects. Is there an opportunity mm -hmm. for them as their yes. high school project or as their, you know, yeah. summer school project? Absolutely. We are always looking for, for collaborators. And I mean, um, there's, um, there's, there's, there's always new work that, that could be done. I mean, if, if someone wants to work, if someone's learning Syriac and wants to work on a, a new translation, for instance, of a saint's life or a homily on a saint, um, or even just to do a comparative study. I mean, I think those can be really wonderful um, types of, of studies too, just to look at different different types of, of saints and see patterns um, in the stories and the, the people's lives. I like to study how traditions move from place to place too, about the saints. It can, like St. Thomas is a great example. So he's also venerated in, in Edessa as well as India. So you can see um, how communities can also join one another through um, their devotion of the same saint. So you can have families built that way too, or it, say they each have relics of the different saints. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you have been teaching for 11 years um, yeah. in the Department of Theology and focusing primarily on historical theology. You have mm -hmm. encountered countless students of varying backgrounds. What is something that you would love about the Korean literary world that you would like to impart in your students? Oh, yes. Well, I would say, um, perhaps in, in my opinion, and I think this is something that many of my colleagues would share, um, the poetic approach that is um, that was so masterfully uh, done by the Syrian um, theologians like St. Ephraim, that is perhaps the most exciting thing to teach because it is so beautiful and so different. Um, uh, it, it captures my students on this whole other level because um, it's, it's, it's not a, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a genre which is more, best suited for speaking about the mysteries of God, like something like the incarnation, the paradox of the incarnation, that God that God would love us so much that he would become a man in the person of Jesus Christ. 
How can you understand it? Well, we can only say what it's like, like and we can only praise it and, and be in great wonder. So that, that, that approach of, of poetry and wonder is, I think, vital. It is vital that my students up here at Marquette coming from Western churches, it's vital that they understand that and they learn about that because it's so exciting and it's so important. And you start to um, see that um, there's, there's more than there, there's a variety of ways for understanding God and poetry is a very important one. Wonder is a very important one. Not everything has to be explained in philosophical, um, uh, philosophical language, for instance, maybe that doesn't work. Maybe poetry is just as important. So I would say that, uh, but also, um, it's important that my students know that Christians in the Middle East and in, in the Orient in India exist because sometimes they don't even know about that. Absolutely. And that's very important. So for my heart, I should have said this back in the beginning. Um, one of the things that I was really excited about when I got into this field was that there is living heritage of churches as yours. And I wanted to devote myself to my, my career um, I, I, I wanted to devote myself to bringing attention, not just to the literature, not just to the theology, but also to the people themselves, and many of whom have suffered terribly. I mean, we don't understand that in, in, in our country often. And so I think it's extremely important that the living heritages and the living peoples that we know about them and that, yeah, that yeah. Um, it's very difficult to convince people in the West that you know Christianity existed in India or Christianity <laughs> in a Middle East religion. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Christianity is a Middle Eastern religion. Christianity is a religion of the East, period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You know, sometimes we say that, you know, we are still using the same language. Um, that Christ used in our liturgy, like, you know, this is how we worship. So yeah. we cherish it's that. It's beautiful. Liturgy. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, as well, so you should. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. I, I just, I mean, and, and that's frankly why it's, it's such an honor for me to be speaking with you, because this means so much to me that, that you would ask, that you from your tradition that, you know, I mean, I, I dare say it, it can, it can, I experienced a whole um, new conversion of my heart as a young person when I first got into Syriac studies through studying the Syriac heritage. And so to be connected also to the living church is so important to me. So it's such an honor to speak with you all about that. Yeah. So um, uh, to, to the viewers, if you are interested in learning more about, you know, Saint, Dr. St. Lawrence's work, so make sure you know the link is the posted here you can have a look at that you can purchase the book and there's a lot of materials available so you know if you would like to um you know know more about her works and you know go through the work you know uh, this is a great opportunity and before we conclude i have one final question so mm -hmm. humor in syriac Hagiography. So that is something that, you know, you, I, I saw a paper that you have, you know, you published, like, you know, humor. So can you give <laughs> an example before we conclude, like, you know, so the divine humor you have sure. noticed in the Syriac uh, hagiography. Yes, I think it's so, you know, I will say I wrote that paper for some context at a very difficult time in my life. My mother was dying and my mother of blessed memory. And so I was looking to my own sources to find a source of comfort. And I thought there's got to be something about humor in the lives of the saints. And in fact, I found it. And my favorite example is um, the story of a stylite saint. So another saint who lives on top of a pole in John of Ephesus, and he was called Zuuro. Um, and so that means short in Syriac. And so he literally was Shorty, the stylite saint. So he was, his name was Shorty, but he stood on top of a pole. And to me, that was an example of humor. I, I'm sure that, it, that we were meant uh, to giggle at that. Um, and yeah. <laughs> so that's my favorite example. But there, there's, there's others. Anytime that you have these unexpected things, they're meant to pull us out a little bit and make us scratch our heads. I think that's, that's an example of humor. 
Yeah. So do, do, do you have, I mean, you know, the humor is one way to get into people's mind and, you know, maybe that's one way to disseminate the love of God as well. So um, uh, yeah. do you have any projects in the pipeline? Like, you know, you write about <laughs> humor. I, well, I suppose this is kind of funny. My next project is I've been interested in actually the study of vices. Uh, in Christianity, in early Christianity. And so I'm thinking now I'm going to be writing about um, eating practices and in particular the uh, the vice of gluttony in the Syriac tradition. <laughs> so what what it is um, about what we eat and what we what we drink and how that um, was considered in the ancient world. And it's been actually a really fun project because it's not something that modern people talk about anymore. But in the ancient church, it was considered a vice. So I've been looking at that and it's um, it's it's been very it's been very um, illuminating. So I'll keep you posted on on how my my gluttony book is going. <laughs> yeah, that's we have a lecture series on uh, more Philexinos of Mabug, and you know, um, so the uh, it's a three lecture series coming up uh, from next um, uh, Saturday. So and the last uh, lecture is on gluttony, like you know, so more Philexinos oh, yeah. have written a lot of things, and you know, the last one is specifically on gluttony. It's glad that fantastic. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a great. That's a great. Um, that's a great discourse that Philoxenus wrote on on yeah. gluttony. Yeah, yeah. I'll really enjoy that. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. You know, it's been an hour time. I know we really enjoyed your presence, and thank you so much for joining us here at Or Oh, the it's way. a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you very uh, much. Thank and if you. anyone ever wants, my email is up online at Marquette University. You can find me in the theology department. Please send me an email if you ever want to correspond about anything. Thank you. Thank you. God bless mm -hmm. your work. May all glory God bless you. to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Thank you so much. Good night, Good night viewers. Good um, night. Again, Dr. St. Lawrence. Good night now. Thank you.